Good. All right. Now, one of the main things I like to do on these dedication type days is to reflect a little bit on parenting. Um, and as I was praying about today and wondering, you know, what should I speak on? Um, I felt drawn to the one of my favourite stories in the whole Bible, and it's John chapter nine, and it's printed in your order of service. It's a long story, um, but we're going to read it together, and I'm going to reflect on it, um, how it gives us insight um, for parenting. So it's our second Bible reading for day, and Sandra, Yvonne's mum, is going to come and read it for us there. So get your orders of service out and follow along. It's a it's a beautiful story um, and a powerful one as well. So let's hear it together. Thank you. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day in which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind men. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciples. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world 
so that the blind will see and those who will see, those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin, but now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Thank you, Sandra. That was most beautifully read, wasn't it? And brought the story to life as, as she was reading it to us. On the uh, 25th of last month, um, Christian Livermore, who is an American writer, released her memoirs or reflections on what it meant to grow up as a poor child in America. And Christian was a shy little girl. She grew up in a turbulent family that through a lack of employment and money, slowly descended down through the ranks of poverty until uh, the family ended up on one of the housing estates of America. And it was a family that experienced uh, this continual downward spiral of poverty after her father gave up work due to a neck injury. And so her childhood became one that was increasingly characterised by poverty, uh, by physical violence, by substance abuse and by mental illness. Uh, and she begins the introduction to her book by describing an incident in the seventh grade at school. Uh, and this is, I wanna read that incident to you. And this is what she says, uh, follow me here. She says, I'm rummaging through the junk drawer in my father's kitchen, looking for clay or putty or corking. I'm 12 years old and I have an assignment due the following day for earth science. I have to make a working volcano. But on the night in question, my father has said he can't afford the plaster of Paris I need to make this working volcano. So I'm looking for anything I can use instead. It's early in my seventh grade year. Until now, I've been in a class only with students from my side of town, the poor side. But it's a small town, so the rich kids and the poor kids are now funneled into one junior high school and I find myself sitting next to classmates sporting all the markers of wealth, straight teeth and sandy hair, eyes odd t-shirts and mat madras skirts and boat shoes. Says, I'm desperate for a pair of boat shoes and I found some at the Salvation Army that are a size too small. I buy them anyway with $3 I got somehow. I don't remember where and I jam my feet into them and wear them until a bony bump emerges on my heel. Eventually, I can't take the pain anymore and give up wearing them. The bump is there to this day. So I find nothing in the kitchen, so I move to the bathroom. My gaze descends the row of shelves in the bathroom closet, and finally, on the floor, they settle on an unop unopened bag of kitty litter. So I stir the litter into a sluice held together with flour, water, and glue until it resembles a melting ice cream sundae. I hollow out a cavity at the top, insert the mouthwash cap and smooth the slurry around it to hold it in place. In class the next day, I arrive before anybody else and set my volcano on the windowsill. Bits of kitty litter shake loose onto the tray and I quickly take my seat. My classmates file in and place their exquisitely constructed volcanoes alongside mine. And as they set down their volcanoes, they cluster around mine and laugh. And I sit in my seat pretending to be engrossed in a book. The teacher arrives and the class begins. One by one, my classmates demonstrate their volcanoes, which spew and sputter and send lava flowing down their perfectly crafted slopes. And when we are down to one volcano, mine, Mr. Brown calls on me to take my turn. I picture the volcano behind me, kitty litter pebbles skidding off its slides, sides, and I feel my face bloom red, and I say I haven't done the assignment. There is only one volcano left, and all the other students have demonstrated theirs, so Mr Brown knows I'm lying, and so do all my classmates. But Mr Brown is a prince among men and pretends he doesn't. He pretends to scold me for not doing my work and says that just this once, because I'm usually such a good student, he'll give me extra time. So at home, I tell my father what happened and give him a note from Mr. Brown. I don't know what it says, but I think my father is embarrassed by it. He drives me to the store and buys me plaster of Paris and I work all weekend to finish my volcano and demonstrate it the following Monday. 
She concludes by saying this. She says, the shame of this episode is with me even now. It's like a piece of gut I've coughed up in my throat and it will be there until the day I die. Now, if we look carefully enough, our schools are full of children like Christian. Um, maybe not so much on the poverty level, physical level, but certainly on the emotional level. Our schools are full of children who desperately try to cover their insecurity, fearful less that their less than glamorous parents and home lives will be discovered and exposed to ridicule by the other children. Children that are squeezing their feet into shoes that are much too small for them so they can fit in. But even if they're not the poor kid in class, they soon find that other children will find something to ridicule. Uh, the comments will soon come like, you're too small, you're dumb, you're clumsy, and we don't want you playing with us because you're not good enough or you're not smart enough. Or they'll pick on some physical feature of the child, you're fat, you're ugly, you're blind because you wear glasses. Or, or in my, my case, I got nicknamed Dumbo the Flying Elephant because when I was at school, I had these massive big ears that jutted out sideways. And uh, that was my nickname that I got, Dumbo the Flying Elephant. You see, I'm not sure why it is, but children seem to delight in pointing out things that are a little bit different than other children and then teasing them over it. So if you look at our playgrounds long enough, you'll find these lonely, marginalised little ones often playing alone because nobody else wants to play with them. They're little children that are desperately trying to fit in. They try at the start and they slowly give up as they're consistently rejected over time. And if the parents are aware of these things or don't know how to deal with them well, then the children often grow up through adulthood carrying the scars from school that never completely disappear. Now, the passage that we've just read today describes a man who represents these things in the culture of Jesus' day. He was a blind man and he lived on the margins of Jewish society and he was forced to beg each day for anything that could come his way. Now, we don't know if he lived with his parents at home, but you can imagine each day his parents would have walked him down to this little spot on the side of a road, this little dirt patch where he would sit and he would beg. And it was in this place that Jesus found him, drawn to him by a question by his disciples as to what sin had contributed to his derelict state. That's their question. Whose sin was it? His or his parents? That means that he sits here in the dirt and begs. Now, I'll address the question of his sin in a moment. For now, I want you to understand how this story relates to parenting. Because, you see, what we're going to find in the story is that Jesus th progressively transforms the life of this man, transforms him from the margins of society. And as we understand how Jesus transformed the life of this man, we can understand how we can minister to our children as they encounter the challenges that they encounter at school and then often through life. You see, this man's life was transformed by this encounter with Jesus. And as we understand what Jesus did, we can better understand how to equip our children for the pressure that will come upon them in school and then thereafter in life because it doesn't change it just gets in a sense more sophisticated and more developed now, as we look at the story i want to suggest that jesus transformed three things about this man all right three things i'm going to give you three words and if you take these three words away i hope you get the guts of what i'm talking about today he transformed his purpose transformed this man's purpose he transformed this man's identity and he transformed this man's destiny, all right? Purpose, identity, destiny. And as he transformed these things in this man, he transformed everything. And you see, this man's life was never the same after this encounter with Jesus. It changed everything. And if we understand how Jesus transformed these three things in him, we can also understand how to equip our children with these three things, three things and make them stronger for life as well. All right, so let's begin with the first. Let's see how Jesus transformed his purpose, transformed his purpose. Now, make sure that you've got your little um, handouts there because you'll need them as we go along just to help you understand how this is working. So let's begin and see how Jesus tr transformed his purpose. Now, the story begins with one of the most profound questions that the human race has ever asked itself, and that is, what is the cause of suffering? What brings suffering? Now, you notice how the story begins. We're told that as he, that is Jesus, 
went along, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, their question is profound because it illustrates a belief that is common amongst religions and common amongst people, and that is that human suffering in some way is always directly related to some person's sin. So in this case, it was a human disability, blindness. And what they're saying is, he's blind. So there's got to be someone to blame. There's some reason why. Some sin that's been committed, that means that he's blind. And they asked Jesus, was it his sin or was it his parents' sin? Now, clearly this understanding of suffering was the belief of Jesus' disciples uh, because they don't even ra raise an alternate question. For them, it's more choice between his sin and, it, and the parents' sin. They don't think of an alternative to that. But also as we go along, you'll see that this was also the understanding of the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' day. Now they, at the end, they conclude, you're born in sin. So why are you lecturing us? All right? That's where they get to in the story. So what they're implying is, hey, you're a beggar because you're born in sin. So don't you try and teach us. Don't you try and teach us. Now, we're going to see that Jesus rejects both of these two options, that it was the man's sin and was also the parent's sin. Uh, and he gets to an alternative to that. And, and I want to come to that alternative. But let me briefly explore these first two options first. The first option is that my suffering is someone else's fault. My suffering is somebody else's fault. Now, this option is implied in the disciples' suggestion that the blind man's disability was caused by sin in his parents' life. They're saying, well, they must have sinned or done something wrong. So God is punishing them by giving them a blind son. And from this perspective, as the blind man looked at his suffering, he could say, it's all my parents' fault. It's because they did something wrong. If they hadn't done something wrong and sinned, well, then I'd be perfectly okay. See, that's what they're implying by this. And in some ways, this approach to suffering is also fairly modern. Um, it's been, become fairly commonplace in some forms of counselling to encourage people to go back uh, and to analyse all the things that their parents did wrong uh, and to try and sort it from there. And so if you do this, do this according to the way it's presented, but not everybody presents this at all, by any stretch of the imagination, but so often it's go back and look what your parents did wrong because that's where you'll find where you got hurt and damaged. And so what we do is we transfer our problems to our parents and the way they brought us up. Um, in other more scary ways this shows itself is when, we, when a society blames a particular group of people for the society's problems. Um, you know, a society says it's their fault that we're in the mess that we are in. I mean, that's not new. That's what Hitler did with the Jews uh, in the Second World War. It's the Jews' fault. And so we can exterminate them because it's their fault, you see. Um, so this is the first approach to suffering. It's, say, it's someone else's fault. The reason I'm suffering is because it's someone else's fault. The second is that my suffering is my fault. Uh, and this approach is found in the disciples' suggestion that it was because of the man's own sin that he was born blind. Now, now clearly the man could not have sinned before he was born. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, so what they're probably suggesting is that somehow God looked forward into the future and said, this man is going to be sinful and selfish, and so I'm going to strike him with blindness in advance of him being born. It's essentially what they're saying. So this man's blindness is his own fault. It's because he was a horrible person that he was made this way. Now, we all know that that idea just doesn't make sense when we push it and we think about it deeply enough. Does that mean that everybody born with some form of disease or disability is a horrible person? Of course not. Some of the most beautiful people I've met in life have been people that have had um, you know, illnesses and other things that have just transformed them into the most beautiful people um, that I've ever seen as they've triumphed over odds, as they've pushed through problems and things like that. They've become out beautiful on the other side of it. So we, it's just laughable that we would see it that way, but it's it's often the way people see it. But you know, in some ways, this approach is subtly a part of our modern life. It happens when successful, pre when successful people preach, if only you're as good as me, 
If only you were as disciplined and dedicated as me, then you too could be successful. All right? You could too be just like I am. They say, look at me. If you're sick, then it's because you don't have enough faith or it's because you're not taking care of yourself enough. Or they say, if you are poor, it's because you're not working hard enough. Get off your butt and do something. Or they say, if you have problems, it's because you're not doing enough about those problems. Go and get a job and stop being a depressed bludger. All right, now I'm using pretty raw terms, but you get what I'm talking about here. But what these wealthy and successful people often overlook is the fact that their wealth and success has often been built on their privileged upbringing in some ways. You know, they started with a base that a lot of poor people never ever get. And so when they get to these successful positions and look down with contempt on those that are poor and say, if you only worked harder, you'd be better, they're missing the fact that they started from a platform that was way in front of where the others were starting for. The real poor are starting from way, way back. They've disadvantaged to overcome that none of the wealthy ever had to experience. They're starting with none of the advantages that the wealthy had. But the wealthy in their pride condemn them and say their lack of success is because they didn't work hard enough. All right. Now, if you go back and read Christian Livermore's book, and it's well worth a read, um, you'll, you'll, you'll see her illustrating this fact. She said, as a poor child growing up in America, um, I had disadvantages that, in a, in a sense, I can never overcome. She would say that. I mean, research scientists are finding now that the poor um, continue into life with the impact of their poverty that never really ever leaves them completely. And this is what Christian Livermore says. He said, if you look at my life today, I have capacities, I have limited capacities because of my upbringing that just others don't have. All right. So when the when the wealthy and the rich and the successful condemn the poor for their lack of success, in effect, they're saying your suffering is your own fault. All right. It's a subtle form, but it's there. All right. Let's go and see what Jesus has to say about this. All right. We want to look now at Jesus' response. Jesus' response is found in verse three. He says to the disciples, "No." He says, "No. Your starting presupposition is wrong. You're mistaken." Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But, he goes on to say, but this happened that the work of God might be displayed in him. So Jesus is saying that neither the personal sin of the man and his parents are to blame, but that something else is at work here. Now, I've deliberately said neither the personal sin of the man and his parents are to blame, because I want to make an important point now about the Bible's view of suffering. All right? If you if you take nothing away today apart from what I'm going to share with you now, then I'll, I feel I succeeded, all right? So I, want to, I want to make this point for you. And this is it. The Bible indicates that all suffering comes from sin in general, but not necessarily from sin in particular, all right? All suffering comes from sin in general, but not necessarily from sin in particular, now, what we do is we learn this if we go back to Genesis chapter 3 and 4 and the entry of sin into our world. And there we learn that the reason that there is suffering and pain in our world is because sin was introduced into the human race by Adam and Eve's disobedience toward God. So when Adam and Eve decided to go their own way and to become their own masters, then not only did they bring sin into the world, but they also brought pain and suffering into the world. See, God originally created the world to flourish, to grow, and he placed humankind into that creation as the vice regent, as God's overseer, to help cultivate the world to flourishing. But once we lost our connection with God, then our rulership over our world became distorted and oppressive. You see, as sin and selfishness entered our hearts, now we ruled not for the benefit of the world and not for the benefit of others, but for the benefit of ourselves. We rule now for our selfish gain. So what happened is sin became the default master in our world. And as a result of that, God says, from here on, the world is just not going to work like I originally intended. Now we'll be subject to disease, decay and death. And that's why pain, suffering and disability have come into our world. It's because of sin in general. Right? Sin in general. 
It was not the man's sin or the sin of his parents, but it was sin in general that contributed to his situation. In his case, you see, the genetics of sin had a line to produce blindness at birth. In other cases, they aligned to produce deafness or cancer, dementia, that's what I'm seeing in my dad at the moment, um, and then other diseases. In my case, they aligned to produce cardiovascular disease, uh, and that alignment meant that without the intervention of a brilliant GP a few years ago and some very gifted surgeons, I'd probably be dead sometimes in the next five years. All right, because they aligned for me in blocked arteries that will eventually lead to a fatal heart attack. That's just the way it was for me. So what Jesus is saying in the response to his disciples is it's not sin in particular that has led to the blind, man's blindness, but to sin in general. It's not his sin or the sin of his parents that made him born blind, but sin in general. Now, that doesn't mean that our individual sins can't contribute to our suffering. You know, if we neglect our bodies or if we abuse drugs and alcohol, it will contribute to our individual suffering. There's nothing we can do to avoid that reality. But Jesus is referring to those things over which we have no control, such as our genetics and the way we've been born and corrupted by sin. All right, so the first, that's the first point I want you for us to understand about sin and suffering and the way Jesus is responding to it is it's due to sin in general, not sin in particular. But then look at the way Jesus redeems this brokenness in our lives in the second part of his response to the disciples. Having rejected the notion that this man's blindness was due to sin in particular, Jesus goes on to explain how God can turn our diseases and other things into good. He said, neither this man nor his parents sin, but, see what he says, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, there are two ways that we can interpret this statement of Jesus. We can interpret Jesus as saying, well, God allowed this man to be born blind so the works of God would be displayed in him. Or we can interpret him as saying, the fact that this man is blind means that God's works can now be displayed in him. In other words, his blindness now has given God the opportunity to display something beautiful. Either way, what Jesus is doing is transforming the man's blindness from a disability to an opportunity. All right? That's what he's doing. He's transferring this man's blindness from a disability to an opportunity. Jesus is saying God never wanted this man to be born blind. That was never God's desire. It was the result of general sin in the world. He hates, God hates the pain that it causes. He really does. You have multiple examples of that in the scriptures that God weeps and groans over the sin in our world. He never wants that. But what Jesus is saying is, but if we allow it, this suffering, this disability can be turned into another purpose. It can be turned to display the works of God in the world. And this is what I mean about Jesus transforming our purpose. All right? We know in this instance that the works of God that were performed in this man was healing from his blindness. But I want to suggest that the same principle applies to us. All of our weaknesses, all of our diseases, all of our disabilities can, if we let God, be used to display his works, to, be, to display his glory. This word work or works that Jesus uses is referring to something very specific. He tells us in verse 5 that it, is, that it is the works of him who sent me. So he's referring to his father, saying these are my father's works that can be displayed through us if we allow God to do so. In John 17, further on in this gospel, just before he's about to die, Jesus says, and I quote him, Father, I have finished the work that you gave me to do. I finished the work that you gave me to do. Now, what was that work? Well, we're told that it was revealing God to people. It was teaching them about God's words and wisdom. And in the end, it was Jesus sacrificing his life for us, for, for us all. That was his major work in that sense. And in verse 4, you see in your story, he calls his disciples to do the same. He says to them, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Now, you see, this is how Jesus transforms our purpose in life. He's teaching us that life is not all about making a lot of money, about having grand houses, 
about being beautiful, about being successful, about being popular. And, and you see, this is really important, we get this. It's in helping our children to understand this that we do a massive service to them. We really, really do. If we communicate to our kids that life all about is all about being beautiful, it's all about being powerful, it's all about being successful, then school eventually will break them. Now that's especially true if you have something odd about your physical appearance or you're not the best looking one in the class or if you're not sporty or if you're not really smart or if you don't re wear the right clothes, all right? If all those things are true of you, eventually you're going to feel it in the school ground. And if we persuade our kids that life is all about winning, it's all about being successful, it's all about being the best, being the most popular, the most successful, etc., then eventually they're going to get crushed by school and by life. You see, if we persuade them, on the other hand, that life is all about doing the works of God, if life is all about serving others, all about being kind, all about loving other people, all about looking after the lonely and the marginalised. It's all about building people up rather than cutting people down. It's all about showing Jesus by our works and our attitudes. Then what we're doing is we're setting them up for true success. We really are. So displaying the works of God, says Jesus, is the true purpose of life. And this is something that any of us can do, even if we have a disability like this blind man did. So this is the first thing that Jesus transforms our purpose. S secondly, and you'll be very glad to know this, the next two points are much briefer than the first one, right? We're going to get done a lot quicker than you're thinking, oh man, look at the time Tim's going to take. No, the next two are a lot quicker, all right? So th this is the first thing that Jesus transforms, our, person, our purpose. Secondly, the second thing he transforms is our identity. He transforms, transforms our identity. Now, as the story unfolds, you'll see that the identity of the blind man is slowly changing, or actually quite rapidly changing. See, in the story, he moves from being a marginalised beggar to, in the end, being a bold confronter of the religious leaders of his day. In verse 6, we have him as a blind man with mud on his face now because of what Jesus has done. Whereas in verse 30, we find him out theologizing, I think that's, that's probably not a word, anyway, um, out theorizing the theorists of his day. That'll work, all right? And um, in fact, we find that he outsmarts them so badly that eventually they just throw him out of the place. Um, so we're going to see, through the story, you see his Denny changing, marginalized beggar at the start, very confident at the very end. Now, the important thing to note is that this new identity and this new confidence is related to his growing understanding of who Jesus actually is, all right? They're connected. His new identity and new confidence is related to his growing understanding of who Jesus is. Let me show you that to you. Now, as the story goes on, you'll see that his understanding of who Jesus is grows. Uh, in verse 11, all he really knows is that he has been encountered by this man that they call Jesus. That's all he knows, all right? He's been blind up until this point, but he's encountered Jesus. When they ask him, who is he? It's just it's this Jesus, all right? But in verse 17, we have a step forward in his understanding of Jesus. He says there in verse 17 that this Jesus is a prophet. Now, it's fascinating to see how he comes to that conclusion. In verse 13, he's been brought to the Pharisees who, had, who were divided over who Jesus actually was. Some said, well, he's a sinner because he broke the Sabbath. Others said, no, no, how can a sinner perform such signs? So eventually, I love the way this story is. It's always my, one of my favourite stories. So eventually, in desperation, they turn to the blind man for an answer. They say, you're the one who healed. What do you think about Jesus? Now, can you see the, the ridiculous nature of this? These are the intellectual elite. These are the religious, religious leaders of Jesus' day. They can't sort this out. So they turn to this blind beggar and say, no, you tell us what the answer is. All right, that's what's happening here. That's crazy. I wouldn't normally dream of asking such a person for advice. So the blind man has been sitting here, uh, listening to their discussion as they go backwards and forwards. No, he's a sinner. Yes, he's a sinner. No, no, no. Uh, and then they say, well, what do you think? And he says, well, he's a prophet. He's a prophet. Now, did, did he know Jesus was a prophet? Well, probably not. 
But what he's doing is adding up the logic of it, you see. He said, he looks at, he knows from his Old Testament background, from his history, that prophets generally are the ones who do miracles. And so he's saying, well, he's done this miracle, prophets do miracles, so he's probably a prophet, you see. Um, walks like a prophet, smells like a prophet, speaks like a prophet, he must be a prophet. That's really what he's doing here, you see. He's just going with the logic. And that's what he says to the, the Pharisees. Well, he's just a prophet. And now, that's not the answer they want. So they start the endless round of questions again, but this time they bring his parents into it. All right? So that's the, he's moved from Jesus general to Jesus a prophet. And now in verse 33, he concludes that Jesus must be from God. He's changed again. And that's how that happens. In verse 24, the Pharisees bring him, bring him in again. Uh, and this time they want him to deny who Jesus actually is. Um, they say in verse 24, <laughs> I love this, give glory to God by telling the truth. We know this man is a sinner. All right, so all they want him to do is acknowledge that Jesus is a sinner, you see. Uh, by this time, the men starting to run out of patience with him. And in verse 27, he says, I've told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Now, that response really gets up their nose. Uh, and in verse 20, 28, they respond by hurling insults at him, saying, you are this fellow's disciples. We're disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. Now, it's at this point, the blind man completely outlogics the logicians. He says, beginning in verse 30, now, that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person. He does his will. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. What he's saying to them is follow the logic. Only God could do these things. So he must be from God. And to this they reply, well, you're steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they throw him out of the place. All right? If you can't outsmart them in the, in the argument, then just throw them out. That's basically what's happening here. Now, the point that I'm making is that this man's transformed identity was attached to his transformed understanding who Jesus was. As he grew more and more aware of who Jesus was, then he became more and more aware of who he was as a result. He was concluding, really, this Jesus who must be from God could stop to love and rescue me, then I must be valuable. I must have worth and significance. And that's what transformed his identity, is because Jesus' love said to him, you're valuable and precious to me, and I'm from God. And so suddenly his identity was transformed. And this is the second valuable thing we can do for our children. We can help them to understand their identity in Jesus. And as they understand more and more that they're loved and valued by him, they don't need to prove themselves so much in the playground at school. They can accept rejection in that place without it crippling them because they know at the end of the day, Jesus loves me. Well, it doesn't matter what you think of me. I know Jesus loves me. All right, that's what matters. All right, the third and final thing is that Jesus transforms his destiny. All right, destiny. And this is going to be really brief. I'm not going to say much about this because really this is a sermon for another time. But you see, after the blind man is thrown out of the synagogue and Jesus finds him, Jesus asks him a question. He says, do you believe in the Son of Man? Now the man eventually responds by saying, Lord, I believe. Now if you know the rest of your Bible, you'll know that that really is a statement of trust in God and of coming into a relationship with God. So that's what's happened. This man now has come into a relationship with God as a result of this experience. And that relationship not only changes his present purpose and identity, but also changes his future destiny. Right? It gives him a future destiny where everything wrong in this world will somehow be unwound, where every injustice, where every disability will be overcome, where every deed done for God will be rewarded. And why is this important for our children? It's important because, you see, no matter how well our kids live, no matter how well, how we, well we live, no matter if we even embrace this whole idea of our purpose and identity in Jesus, our world is still broken. Disabilities still exist. Injustices are still done. Insults are still flung. Right? 
So our children need to know and need to understand that this world is not the end of it. There is another world coming. There's another world coming where every tear will be wiped from their eye, where every disability and disease will be corrected, where justice will finally be done, and where everything in creation will finally be released to be all that it was originally intended to be. You see, our children need to understand this because ultimately, otherwise, injustice doesn't make sense. Doing good doesn't really make sense if it's all just going to finish at the end of this time. Disabilities don't make sense. Disease doesn't make sense. You see, if there's no final accounting in a world, then the life of Hitler is treated the same as the life of Mother Teresa. So why do good? What difference does it make? But Jesus' teaching and resurrection assures us that there is another world coming where God will be the judge and will have the final say. And that's our destiny. And that means that when we work the works of God in this life, they're done for a reason and they have value and meaning and significance. And when God takes our weaknesses and makes something beautiful out of them, then that's even more outstanding. It really, really is. There's something beautiful when the strong and the powerful do something good. It's even more beautiful, even more staggering when the weak do something amazingly good. All right? That's our God. And that's what I'm saying. As parents, let's communicate these three things to our kids. This is your purpose in Jesus. This is your identity in Jesus. This is your destiny in Jesus. And I really trust that God will bless you guys as you seek to make that real in your son's life.